Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to be reviewing Out of Sheer Rage by Jeff Dar whilst going for a walk along the River Gipping. I'm starting here, uh, just outside the, uh, the village of Bramford and doing the walk all the way along to the historic Ipswich Harbour. Uh, you can't see it, but through the trees there is uh, St. Mary the Virgin's church, uh, an Anglican church. Okay, so um, out of sheer rage, the subtitle of the book is In the Shadow of D.H. Lawrence, um, or in some versions, it is uh, wrestling with D.H. Lawrence. So this book is um, not how it presents, basically. In the spirit of the age, I uh, haven't even read any D.H. Uh, Lawrence, uh, shame on me, um, but I have read uh, Jeff Dyer um, out of sheer rage. So the book presents originally as a writer trying to write a kind of serious academic work on D.H. Lawrence and failing to do so. So the book seems to be, at face value, a writer struggling to write. And he is a particularly neurotic and, you know, all over the place kind of writer. Someone that is uh, incredibly um, undecisive. Um, the entire kind of first section of the book um, the Jeff Dyer character um, is being insanely indecisive, like to the nth degree. So, you know, he's, he's uh, at one point heading off to uh, a Greek island where he thinks, oh, I'll be able to do some of my D.H. Uh, Lawrence work while I'm there. And he agonizes over whether he should be taking along with him D.H. Um, Lawrence's uh, complete works of poetry um, because he will need it um, if he's in order to, uh, you know, embark upon this uh, academic work of D.H. Lawrence. And he goes, will I take it? If I do take it, I'm going to focus on it. But should I focus on it? Maybe I should be enjoying the holiday. And then when I get back from the holiday, that's when I'll really knuckle down, and so therefore maybe I shouldn't take it, but oh, but, but if I was wanting to do something, then, then I'd definitely need it. Um, but oh, and, and he goes back and forth like this. As I say, an agonizing amount. And this is not just at the beginning. This is to do with everything going throughout the entire novel, basically. There's another very um, long section in which he is um, thinking about where he should live. And he is again agonizing about this. He's a writer. He's trying to write this academic work, supposedly, on D.H. Lawrence. <clears throat> and he's agonizing about where one should live if they were going to do this. Um, should he live in Rome? His uh, partner lives in Rome, and so that seems like the logical place to be. And so he does spend some time in Rome, but he agonizes about maybe somewhere else would be better and more appropriate. Um, and he eventually ends up in Oxford, which he acknowledges or believes to be the worst possible place um, that you could possibly be if you're writing an academic work on D.H. Lawrence. And yet, perhaps, the worst place to be is inversely the best place to be because then you're not worrying about where the best place to be is, right? So this is the kind of neurotic type of thinking which litters um, the entire book. Um, I think, I don't know, my, I'm very unlike this. I don't think, I don't have this kind of, um, will I do this, won't I do this, will I do this um, kind of narrative constantly running through my head. So I couldn't really relate directly to that type of, uh, you know, mental state. I think I tend to just 
decide what I'm going to do and can be rather stubborn in sticking <laughs> to what I've decided unless someone can give me a very good reason not to do that. So I'm almost the opposite of this kind of constant flipping back and forth. Uh, my brother is someone who is much more like this. He uh, assures me often that he's definitely going to do something. And then the next time I talk to him on the phone, he says that, oh no, of course, he was never really going to do that in the first place. And that's much more how Jeff Dyer in this book presents. So it's a book about trying to write a book about D.H. Lawrence, but it's more of his kind of observations about life as he's attempting to do this, and there are elements of travelogue as he travels around to various places that are associated with D.H. Lawrence, and he's kind of getting sidetracked all along the way by points of interest. Um, so it's almost as if, um, although he's setting out to write a book on D.H. Lawrence, he's really writing a book about anything but D.H. Lawrence, but then in a roundabout way, it is kind of about D.H. Lawrence after all. The reason I say that is because as he goes to all these various places and as he explores his own neurosis, neuroses, he's always making links back to D.H. Lawrence in terms of where D.H. Lawrence was um, or where D.H. Lawrence was in his own head. So, you know, it, it turns out that D.H. Lawrence was also a very indecisive type of person, a very neurotic type of person in the way that um, Jeff Dyer is coming across in this book. So as I said, the book essentially tricked me. It presents as being, as I said, a writer struggling with writing about D.H. Lawrence. And as I read the first part of this book, the first third, that is what I thought this book was. And so as I read the, uh, the torment that Jeff Dyer put himself through, this constant neurosis, this constant worrying about not working, I thought, wow, how exhausting it must be to live as Jeff Dyer, and how thankful I was that I am nothing like Jeff Dyer. I do not think <laughs> in the way that Jeff Dyer does. I do not experience the world in the way that Jeff Dyer does. However, as I went further along, um, I realized that something deeper was actually being done here. Uh, although it does present in this way, really what the book is, is a artistic response to the art of D.H. Lawrence. So there's a quote that is referenced in the book by uh, George Steiner, an academic, who says something like, the best response to art or the best readings of art is art. So, you know, instead of um, writing some kind of critical essay on a piece of art, rather it is best to do a piece of art which invokes that piece of art. That is what this is. This is an attempt to do an artistic piece which responds to the literature of D.H. Lawrence, focusing less upon the novels written by D.H. Lawrence and more upon his other work, i.e. His, his essays, his travel logs, um, his reviews, and most pertinently, to, to Jeff Dyer, his letters, because it is his letters which allow Jeff Dyer to get kind of under the skin, basically, of D.H. Lawrence, to understand really how he is experiencing the world. And how is he experiencing the world? Well, very much in the way reflected here by Jeff Dyer. He is experiencing it in this kind of frenetic, neurotic, 
chaotic fashion. It's as if his experience of the world is not being um, mediated through consideration or theory, but as a kind of raw reaction, a raw experience of things. Um, there's a part in the book where it says um, that D.H. Lawrence is best when he's writing in notes, right? So it's instead of, um, you know, writing notes on a subject and taking those notes and turning them into the finished work ultimately, rather the initial notes are the work. And then you get this kind of, you know, you're getting D.H. Lawrence unmediated. And so this is basically that. This is a version, a fictionalized version, of Jeff Dyer giving his unmediated experience of D.H. Lawrence. And Jeff Dyer is really leaning into his kind of D.H. Lawrence persona, if you like, his Lawrencean persona. So there's this uh, section towards um, the end of the book, which I think kind of amusingly does uh, capture what uh, Jeff Dyer is attempting to do. So it says that uh, Jeff Dyer, when he was younger, struggled a great de deal with uh, warts on his hands. And there's a section that says, one day a boy at school told me that they were really good warts. They looked just like real ones. An example of what I would later learn is termed irony. Now, what I think is funny about this is Jeff Dyer is obviously presenting himself in the book Warts and All, but they're not real warts, right? These are, to some extent at least, fictionalized warts, Lorentzian warts, um, in order that he can draw this relationship with D.H. Lawrence. So D.H. Lawrence was uh, from a coal mining village in the north of England called Eastwood. And he had a working class background. His father was a miner. Uh, and that made uh, D.H. Lawrence the first um, author, English author from a working class background. And there's a section in the book where Jeff Dyer goes to Eastwood and experiences Eastwood basically as a tourist, as any other Laurentian tourist might experience Eastwood. Eastwood has now, of course it's no longer a mining town, has basically turned into a, a shrine to D.H. Lawrence. There's a little museum there, there's little, you know, coffee shops with all kind of Laurentian names like Lady Chatterley and places, things like that. And but the odd thing is that D.H. Lawrence hated his town, the town where he came from. Um, he really hated England, basically. He was a kind of, uh, you know, free spirit, almost like a bird um, who wanted nothing else to escape the world he came from and go out and experience the world out there. So Jeff Dyer goes and he's you know, sitting in this coffee shop in Eastwood, you know, just like any other tourist. And, you know, he thinks how dire the whole, I don't know, place is basically, because it's odd. I mean, it was a coal mining town, the town that um, D.H. Lawrence came from. And yet D.H. Lawrence hated the fact that he was from a coal mining town. Um, he hated, you know, where he came from, and he longed to be free, to kind of soar the world like a bird, and, you know, hence his travel logs, his traveling from here to there, um, sea to Sardinia, for example, Jeff Dyer in particular mentions as a favorite amongst his travel logs. 
and of course uh, he also has his uh, time traveling in Mexico and in New Mexico and today even there's a kind of shrine um, near his home there in New Mexico. So he was very much this kind of um, free spirit, unable to be tied down, you know, free by nature. So Jeff Dyer says that um, D.H. Lawrence was basically always just writing about D.H. Lawrence. He was always writing on the state of his own soul. And so in his travel logs, for example, he would go to places and write about them in, um, without much knowledge. He would go to places and having only been there for a day or two, would start writing um, a, you know, travel logs on what it was like to be in those places. But of course, how could he possibly know what it was like to be in those places? But in a way, these places were just um, material that he could use um, in order to um, discuss himself, his own soul, his own character. D.H. Lawrence was a kind of ardent individualist in this way. Um, he didn't believe in kind of, um, I don't know, subordinating himself to some kind of collective identity, um, but rather wanted to kind of, I don't know, pave his own way through the universe to live, you know, deliberately um, and to be present to oneself. It, it strikes me as being very uh, Emersonian, um, in fact. Uh, there's a part in the book where uh, uh, another writer says that, you know, remarkably, D.H. Lawrence uh, never really did anything he didn't want to do. And, you know, I think that characterizes the kind of uh, person that D.H. Lawrence was, his character. Um, it reminds me of a, uh, a quote by Ralph Waldo Emerson, um, which goes something like, um, my uh, desire or my wish as a Christian minister is to do um, nothing other than I feel led to do or it's something like that. I can't remember the exact quote, um, but it's you know very much in that spirit, um, this desire to follow one's own way of being in the world. And so in this way, there's a bit where they talk about uh, the pull towards the East, towards mysticism, towards um, Eastern spirituality, towards Buddhism. And D.H. Lawrence really comes across as almost like the antithesis to Buddhism. You know, if Buddhism is about kind of finding some uh, deep harmony with uh, all that is around you, um, with creation, then D.H. Lawrence was basically like, I don't know, screw that, basically. He wanted to not merge with the cosmos, you know, in the kind of, you know, let's do yoga sense, but wanted to, I don't know, fiercely make his mark and express his own um, individual self fiercely as a fighter. And uh, this uh, finds expression in D.H. Lawrence's famous um, anger and rage, um, which Jeff Dyer also kind of, um, I don't know, incarnates within himself in the novel as well. Um, this kind of constant um, I don't know, internal monologue of rage against the world. He talks about, I think, just going to a coffee shop and trying to buy a donut and then not having the right donut and, you know, feeling intense and insane levels of, of rage pulsating through his body. I'll burn this place down and then they'll know, you know, what inconvenience they caused me denying me my donut. And similarly, D.H. Lawrence was supposedly, um, or as, as, as is said, prone to such fits of unbelievable rage. Um, and yet it was never kind of a, I don't know, unreconcilable rage. 
he was always able to find his way back to himself. Out of sheer rage, uh, Jeff Dyer's book has been described as being genre-defying. It kind of um, comes across as uh, autobiographical or travel log, um, travel log by someone who is um, very neurotic. And as they're going through their own experience, their own travels, they're kind of uh, tangentially hitting upon relevant information to the subject matter at hand, i.e. D.H. Lawrence. And so D.H. Lawrence is kind of dealt with tangentially. That's how it kind of appears or seems uh, until you realize that uh, the whole book is being written in this kind of, um, uh, as a kind of artistic response, a Lorentzian response to Lawrence. Uh, and in this way of being kind of uh, genre-defying, it's been described, or it's been compared to, um, Sibold. It's been described as being Siboldian in the kind of Rings of Saturn sense, which uh, the Rings of Saturn, if you if you don't know it, is a book I, I love. Is a is a Sibold setting out on a walk um, in Suffolk. We are currently in Suffolk, if you didn't realise. Um, and in the course of his walk, kind of falling down rabbit holes, essentially tangential rabbit holes that lead him to kind of little bits of, of interesting information which um, come together into an interesting web of ideas. And this is how, out of um, sheer rage, comes across as well. You're kind of perambulating your way across a terrain. Um, in out of sheer rage, it's not so much physical terrain, but more the, the terrain of um, this fictional Jeff Dyer's mind or his character and you're falling down these rabbit holes which are kind of elucidating aspects of who D.H. Lawrence was. However, although he is, um, although they are compared in this way, uh, I also have read that uh, Jeff Dyer had not read The Rings of Saturn. I don't think it was translated until after his book was um, written and published. So there isn't a direct relationship there. Um, however, I think it was just, or still is, you know, part of the kind of, um, part of the modern literary zeitgeist to write in this way, which is um, very, very close to being non-fiction while in actual fact being fiction. As I said, you know, as you read Out of Sheer Rage, um, if you didn't know any better, you would not think it was a piece of fictional writing. It's only once you've kind of experienced the thing as a whole that you're able to kind of step back and, and realize um, what Jeff Dyer was actually accomplishing in this um, kind of Lorentzian journey. I think there's something about getting close to someone by experiencing their mundane lives. Uh, and, you know, this is basically what Jeff Dyer is, is setting out to do. You know, if you go to the back of the book, the index, you realize just how many times throughout the book he's uh, referenced various sections from D.H. Lawrence's letters, because D.H. Lawrence's letters give you the most kind of um, you know, unmediated experience of Lawrence. And so, in this way, experiencing the mundane Lawrence, his arguments, his, you know, concerns about money and, and paying bills, his uh, endless concern about where he's going to live. You know, he wrote to friends asking them, where should I live? You know, where would it be good for D.H. Lawrence to live? You experience the kind of man he was. You experience him. The mundane Lawrence, the, the mad Lawrence, 
you know, which is why D.H. Lawrence is also attracted more to his non-fiction writing, because you're not getting, you know, you're not getting D.H. Lawrence through this kind of, you, through the fictionalized form, right? Because in fiction, you're obviously creating these characters. And so the experience of the world is always being mediated through these fictional characters. So you're not experiencing the real, the real Lawrence. But in nonfiction, you are experiencing the real, and in his note form, even more so. And I think this problem around the fictionalization um, of the protagonist is where the is where I felt there was a little bit of a problem in Out of Sheer Rage. Because, you know, it feels like on the pages that Jeff Dyer is being, as I said, warts and all, very real with us, expressing his deepest pain, his deepest neurosis, his, you know, wild experience of of reality. And yet, once you realize the entire thing has actually been a deceit, he's actually trying to um, express to you um, a kind of artistic response to Lawrence, then you're left wondering, well, how much of this biographical um, Jeff Dyer that we experience in the pages of Out of Sheer Rage is actually Jeff Dyer? You know, there's some gap there. We don't know. It's clearly a lie or fictionalized to some extent, but we're left not knowing to what extent. Is the entire thing a kind of fictional creation? Uh, is he really traveling to all these places and experiencing, you know, walking in, in Lawrence's footsteps? Is that happening on some level uh, or not on any level at all? And wow, it's so difficult to know. Um, you know, I would imagine, or you must conclude, I think, that Jeff Dyer must see in himself something of D.H. Lawrence, something of um, Lawrence's neurotic character must be in Jeff Dyer. You would think, otherwise, you know, why be attra attracted to the figure of Lawrence so much that you want to get under his skin and experience um, the world as Lawrence experiences it? I think another question that the, uh, the book kind of wrestles with is this perennial question that you get in art of the relationship between um, a piece of art and the artist, or a novel and its author. Um, I think in, there's been this trend in more recent um, decades to think of the pieces of art as being something uh, separate from um, the creators of those art, and you know, for good reason. Um, a piece of art is, you know, designed to be experienced as a thing in and of itself. It is not designed to be experienced with the whole, I don't know, biographical backstory of the um, author or artist in question kind of hanging over it. Um, you know, everything doesn't have to be read in kind of biographical terms back into the piece of art. You know, what were the personal neuroses of this individual and why did his pain or his angst cause, you know, the manifestation of this piece of art? You don't have to always be thinking in these kind of so, so reductionistic, basically, to think in, of everything in these very biographical terms. And yet, we're very often inclined to do that. But Jeff Dyer, in his book, I don't know, he almost does a complete reversal of that. You know, if the temptation is to look at D.H. Lawrence's novels, 
Um, so for example, D.H. Lawrence is of course very famous for his very explicit sex in his novels, and so you know, that raises questions about, well, why is that? You know, what is D.H. Lawrence trying to say? What is his commentary on sex? What is the relevance of D.H. Lawrence today on sex? Those types of um, questions. Instead of experiencing, I don't know, the art in and of itself, but rather by flipping it the other way, you're focusing, you're almost kind of changing the hierarchy around. You're not looking at the pieces of art that D.H. Lawrence created. Um, rather, you're almost looking at, I don't know, the life of D.H. Lawrence as a piece of art, the way he lived as art. There is definitely something infectious in uh, Jeff Dyer's appreciation and love for H.D. Uh, Lawrence. You you want to um, experience some of the, the joy that Jeff has clearly got from Lawrence for yourself. And it definitely puts me in mind to read the books in particular that, uh, the DH Law, that uh, Jeff Dyer points to, namely the essays and the poetry. So, for example, his classic um, American study of literature, uh, Jeff Dyer pointed to, uh, and as previously mentioned, Sea to Sardinia, his travel log. As the book does uh, acknowledge, it is irrelevant. The book is utterly irrelevant, whether it's about the character of Jeff Dyer or it's about the character of uh, D.H. Lawrence. Does it really matter? Who cares? Yeah, so it is relevant and it kind of uh, revels in its irrelevancy. Um, you know, it, it wants to uh, spend time in these meaningless moments, just sitting and reflecting on them in order that we can kind of be present to them, I suppose. It's in part a kind of reflection on the desire to do nothing. You desire to do nothing. You're therefore doing nothing, and then that leads to a kind of despair that nothing is being done. And that is kind of the arc of the book. You know, he sets out initially to write this academic book, although that's not really true, but that's kind of the, uh, um, the deceit of the book, that he's setting out to write this academic book, an academic book that he's failing to write, so it's really a book about him not writing a book that he should be writing, and that slowly leads to increasing levels of um, despair, neurosis, going round and round in circles, why am I not doing what I so want to do, and in not doing anything, I am paralyzed by anxiety, and then ultimately by depression. And as we move towards the final, final section of the book, um, I, I can only talk in kind of vague section terms because the book doesn't have chapters. It's a, it's a kind of ongoing uh, diatribe from beginning to end. But anyway, towards the kind of um, latter portion of the book, he talks about the depression which has finally set in. He is sitting, doing absolutely nothing, wrapped up in, I don't know, despair, it's not going anywhere. And what saves him is he becomes interested in depression. And so he reads a little bit about something related to depression, and that kind of starts to pique his curiosity, which leads on to something else, which leads on to something else, and ultimately he achieves a complete reversal, because now he is um, 
kind of thinking about academic topics, academic subjects, once again. So, and that is ultimately his salvation. So it's, it's a kind of almost going into um, the cave, wrestling with the dragon, and emerging victorious. Very kind of Christ-like imagery. Um, you know, dying, going into the tomb, going into the tomb for three days, and then being resurrected. And in the same way, Jeff Dyer goes into his own depression and sits in the darkness of his own despair for days, and then ultimately is able to emerge victorious from the tomb, from his, you know, despair. And I think the kind of um, implication is that his new lease on life gives him the energy to write the book which becomes uh, out of sheer rage. Um, again, that's obviously a kind of fictionalized um, plot line, but, but nonetheless. And I think it also um, reflects something of D.H. Lawrence as well. D.H. Lawrence, um, towards the latter half of his life, uh, in his early 40s, he died young of tuberculosis, um, his body is wasting away and he feels that there will be some future time in which his um, creative genius will be um, recognized for what it is, the, you know, a, a, a kind of a brilliant gift to the world. And so, in a way, um, Jeff Dyer's own going into Christ's tomb, um, you know, Jonah's whale type, type narrative, is what is literally happening to D.H. Lawrence. D.H. Lawrence literally dies, and at some later time, maybe now, uh, in the uh, first portion of the 21st century, people begin to rediscover um, the brilliance of D.H. Lawrence, but they're not rediscovering his creative work, his novels, so much. Rather, there is a reversal, and what is being discovered is his critical work, primarily. And so, D.H. Lawrence is rising from the ashes like the phoenix, which was his emblem. And so, out of despair comes salvation. And so Jeff Dyer concludes that we all need in our lives studies of D. H. Lawrence, which is to say we all need in our lives these kind of um, areas of inquiry or obsessional interests or, you know, I don't know, avenues of avenues that, that kind of bring us to lie and bring us to life in order to give our lives structure, meaning, flavor, purpose, all of the above. Um, you know, in a way, this is what life is about. Um, it is about going from obsessional interest to obsessional interest. Well, despite the, uh, the narrative arc of uh, Out of Sheer Rage being a fiction, my own journey has not been a fiction. From Bramford to here, the uh, historical harbour of Ipswich, and more importantly, to uh, my pint of beer. Well, cheers everyone. Uh, thanks in particular, as always, to uh, those that support me on Patreon. Cheers for watching, and I will see you in the next one.